Uh, let me just apologize right off the bat for the heat. Unfortunately, the building will not let us control the air conditioning. So this is, I'm sorry to say, what it's going to be like. I am going to leave the lights in the back off to try to keep it cooler, and we'll leave this door open. I will have to close the outer door, but if you could keep uh, the noise down, that would be great. And uh, don't breathe. <laughs> don't breathe. Just hold your breath for an hour and a half. <laughs> also, please turn off your cell phones right now. Uh, no pictures, no Twitter, no Facebook during the event, please, please, please. You will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. When you do ask questions, I ask that you please uh, stand up and speak very clearly so, uh, so Lynn and Sheldon can hear you and also so our uh, internet audience can hear the question because they might want to ask that question too. I have my hearing aids. <laughs> <laughs> They're all set. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Terry Stratton, Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild. And, and may I just say thank you so much. I hope my mom is watching. Uh, I just want to thank you all for your wonderful support for these DG Academy seminars that I've been setting up the last few years. And as always, if you have combinations of fabulous people that you would like to see, feel free to email me and I will do my best to try to schedule everybody you want to see. Uh, our Drama Skilled Council are happy to step in and help when they're available. You just need to let me know who you'd like to see. So without further ado, uh, let me just say that not only are these two of the most wonderful musical theater lyricists ever, but <laughs> they are also two of the nicest people on the planet. I love them dearly, and I describe them in Phoenix as tonight's event is going to be like a big warm theater hug. <laughs> so, I hope you all enjoy. I'm just going to throw out a little question to get them started. Then they will converse amongst themselves. And again, we'll start with the questions in about an hour. So my question, my burning question that I want to know is, what was the first show you ever saw? Oh, well, the first show that I ever saw, hmm. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was probably 1966 or 7, maybe. And um, I had never seen a show. I was in college. My family had a, a background of um, artistic endeavors. I was given art lessons. I was given dance lessons, none of which you know I was suited for. Um, <laughs> and we went to concerts, but we never went to shows. And so by the time I got to college, I'd never seen a show. Uh, and I had a boyfriend who um, thought that I might enjoy a musical because I was constantly writing songs. And so he drove me to, down to New York from Syracuse University. I'm going to tell this a slightly long way. Um, we went out to dinner at Mama Leone's, <laughs> where, which was still around, and they brought a huge, about this big, platter of appetizer things, um, olives and carrot sticks and cauliflower and salami, and it was free. It came with the dinner, and we thought it would be only polite to eat the whole thing. <laughs> so we did. We ate the whole thing. And then we passed out from about 6 o'clock to about 7.30 in some hotel lobby somewhere. We just were so saturated with food. And we ended up at a show called Fiddler on the Roof. Oh. And I had no idea what it was about. I had no idea what I was going to see. I had no idea whether or not I would last through the performance uh, awake. And all I can tell you is it was Harry Goss, or Goss, and um, Bette Midler playing the eldest daughter. Mm -hmm. And I began to wake up from my food-induced stupor to this miraculous thing on a stage. Um, I was just uh, gobsmacked, as they say, mm -hmm. at, at this story that was being told, that people dancing and singing and communicating. And it was really the first time, not only that I'd ever seen a, a musical, much less a Broadway musical, but a musical, um, but it was the first time that it occurred to me that stories could be told in song. And so, uh, and I, I had no idea who wrote it. I didn't know anything about anything. Um, but it, it was the first inkling that I had that there was something I was really, really interested in. And um, 
all these many years later, I <laughs> just have to say I'm, I'm so thrilled and honored to be sitting here with my friend Sheldon. I can't believe it. Yeah. Uh, we were not, I, I'm from Chicago. My family was not interested in the theater, and we lived a good 45 minute drive from the loop anyway. But when I was drafted into the Army, my two best friends thought that a nice going away present would be to take me to a loop professional show. And we uh, understood that there was a, a big hit show uh, from New York playing there. So they bought tickets, and we went to see it. And it was called Mary Had a Little. <laughs> it was dreadful. <laughs> and then we later found out that the show that had been a hit in New York was John Loves Mary, and they thought that's what they were buying tickets for. <laughs> and we had Mary had a little. <laughs> that, was, that was the first show I saw. <laughs> we were that innocent. Uh, for this afternoon, I thought what, what might make an interesting program was if we went kind of for a as much time as we have, step by step through our careers and what we learned that we might be of some value to you. So Lynn, why don't you start, what drew you to writing lyrics in the first place? You know, it's a, such a hard question to answer because I, I have a, a little um, uh, recording of myself when I was four, setting lyrics to the melody of Frosty the Snowman. So uh, I think I was a little mini lyricist, you know, from the time I was born. And I don't know. And I wrote songs all through high school, all through college. I, I learned to play the guitar. Music and lyrics? Music and lyrics, both, just mm -hmm. like you. And um, uh, when I first came to New York, I, I got a job in an advertising agency. And they happened, just so happened, to be producing a, a children's show called Schoolhouse Rock which has ended up being quite famous. And I was a secretary at the time, and I would bring my guitar into work and blah, 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 to amuse myself on my lunch hours, although my husband always says it was to you know, just show off, but I know it wasn't. <laughs> and um, they asked me if I'd like to write a song, and I did, and one thing led to another, and I wrote a lot of songs for that series, mm -hmm. to the point where I suddenly <coughs> thought I could be a professional songwriter. I don't need a nine to five job, necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so I was um, sort of brave enough to, to um, try it freelance, and you know, one thing led to another. I started doing television shows, writing for Captain Kangaroo, and writing for shows that I had produced um, myself and created and sold to the networks. And um, it, it took me a long time to get to theatrical writing, and um, but I had always been working as a, a self-contained entity, um, and I ended up. Uh, decided to try to um, take the, go to the BMI workshop, the BMI Musical Theatre Workshop, which is a, a Stephen, my partner Stephen Flaherty always says it's a, it's a dating service for uh, <laughs> composers and lyricists, and, and that's where we had our first date, so to speak, and, and began writing together in 1983. Um, but I know that you uh, studied music, you got your uh, degree in music from Northwestern, right? Yeah. And did the Wang Mu show, I hear, yeah. right? Which is a big deal at Northwestern. But, you know, you keep, forgive me for telling your history, but you, you came to New York to write for the theater. And what made you so bold after having been a dance band violinist and all the things you did? Well, I started writing poetry. My, both my sister and I used to write poetry because that's what my mother did. Every bar mitzvah, every anniversary, she would celebrate with a little poem. So we wrote poems. And when I was in high school, and I had a couple of my poems published, Somebody introduced me to a student who was a year ahead of me who was interested in theater, which was something new to me. His sister was an actress in the little theater movement. So we began to write together, and we began to write song parodies, and eventually we tried our hand at a couple of songs, special material kinds of things. This was all brand new to me, although I had seen my uncle was a performer, and he was in several... Uh, amateur Gilbert and Sullivan companies. And I had seen Gilbert and Sullivan and was very impressed by the Patter songs, particularly. So, uh, and I loved pop music from the radio, but I, I didn't know theater at all. At any rate, um, I was drafted. I kept writing songs in the Army and performing them at USO functions, and I discovered that uh, even though I wasn't sure whether the songs were any good, they were, they were honest accounts of my experiences in the Army, and consequently, the audiences understood them and really relished them. 
which was a good lesson to learn, and I wish I had always obeyed my instinct to do that, to be honest. I haven't always done that. At any rate, by the time I got out of the Army, I wanted to continue playing the violin, but I also wanted to continue to write songs, and I heard, I knew about Northwestern and the WAMU show there. So uh, I went to Northwestern, I kept writing uh, for the WAMU show, but the life-changing experience for me came from a classmate, Charlotte Lubatsky, who you would know as Charlotte Ray. And uh, Charlotte, when I, around 1948 or so, during the Christmas vacation, she'd come to New York. And when she came back, she sought me out. She had an LP in her hand and said, Sheldon, you have to listen to this. So I listened to it. It was, it was Finian's Rainbow. And by the time I got finished with it, I thought, oh my god, what Yip Harburg is doing. What he's saying are important things, but they're done so playfully that you have to listen. And just the, the, the sheer, the word magic was so appealing, I thought, this is what I want to do. So and God was good to me. I thought he had cursed me, but he was being good. I developed a problem where I couldn't play the violin, <laughs> which made many people happy. <laughs> uh, not me. Uh, and I thought, okay, I can't play the violin, so what am I going to do? Let me, I'll go to New York, and I will take all my savings bonds that I had gotten in the Army and what little I had made as a violinist, and I thought I will go to New York and see if I can be a lyricist. Uh, thank God Charlotte had already come, so I had a connection there. Also, when I was in the Army, um, I was at Robbins Field, Georgia, and <laughs> they lost my records. And for 93 days, nobody knew who I was. <laughs> they had sent somebody else overseas thinking it was me. Oh. And on our base, there was a volunteer special service unit, which was run by a man who'd been a theatrical agent in real life. And we became friends. And he said, assuming that we lived through this, if you ever come to New York and you need an agent, look me up. So I did. And he became my agent. Uh, his wife was the choreographer for, for Jackie Gleason, June Taylor, so that helped. Um, at any rate, then it was, once I got here, then it was just networking, networking, networking. And um, Charlotte got a job at the Village Vanguard. I had written a song for her. And she had, through a friend, she invited Yip Harburg down to see her. So I got to meet Yip. And I asked if I could play for him. And uh, I got a pianist, I went to his apartment, and I did mostly what I did was college material, but he was very encouraging. And he gave me two wonderful bits of advice. Uh, the first one, he listened to what I was writing, and he said, your introductions are usually throwaways, musically. You wanna get, you, you, it seems like you wanna get to the chorus where you can do your good music. He said, never, Throw that, throw that away, because people, if they hear the song a second time, they're not going to laugh if it's a comedy song, because they know the jokes. What will keep the song alive is the music. You, so every note you write has to be as good as you can possibly write. Don't throw anything away. And the other thing he said was, uh, he said in his experience, there were more capable theater composers than there were theater lyricists, so that I could facilitate my career by writing with other composers. And uh, I did, I met a number of them. Um, oh, so, and the first step, by, uh, I wrote review material, but I really wanted to write a book show. And I got a call one day from somebody who had heard some of my review songs. He was, uh, his father was wealthy and he had money and he'd, he had gotten the rights to a book. I was very hungry to do a show. It was about the used car business. And I said, fine. It was a terrible experience. <laughs> Among other things, he had a very nervous way of playing the piano when you heard something. He would hit a chord, and it was as though the keyboard were red hot, because then he would draw his fingers by on top. He'd hit another chord and then draw his fingers by. And between his piano playing and the fact that I got to detest the book, I thought, how do I get out of this without giving my advance back? <laughs> and happily, the book writer uh, called a meeting one day and said, this is not working, we should give it up, and we did. And the lesson that I learned from that was never 
do any musical, never uh, commit yourself to something that you don't love because you're going to go through agony. Uh, and uh, usually it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I learned sort of a similar lesson um, way back when, when Stephen and I first started to write because the lesson that I learned was never commit yourself to a musical that you love that you don't have the rights to. <laughs> that's, that's the second part of that's it. That's a very important lesson. Yeah, yeah. because we, we wrote a musical called Bedazzled based on the uh, Peter Cook and Beverly Moon movie and loved it and just thought it was the greatest thing and we presented it here at the Dramatist Guild, I believe for you, Sheldon, way back when. You did, Peter yeah. Sondheim and Peter Stone and this panel of luminaries and we presented Bedazzled. And we had nothing to say because it was perfect. It was hard, <laughs> nothing to say. <laughs> and, um, and we never were able to secure the rights. And but so the lesson, and then the next show that we did, we, we tried to do an original show, which was the, the second part of that particular lesson, which was they're really hard. <laughs> and when you're just starting out, it might be better to do an adaptation. Because mm -hmm. the second show, uh, we had the rights because it was original. It was called Antler. We were working with a, a book, an unknown book writer named George Seawolf. Um, <laughs> and um, we mushed around with this idea for at least a year and a half and could not make it gel. So we had an unproduced musical that we didn't have the rights to. And we had an unproduced musical that we couldn't find the story to. And finally, um, I looked at Stephen and said, you know what? I'm just going to uh, adapt something. I'm going to write the book. I'll write the, the lyrics. You write the music. We'll adapt something. And we'll at least finish it, and it will be producible if anybody wants to produce it, because we will have a story. We will have the rights, and you know, we'll just write it. So we wrote um, a kind of fractured fairy tale version of The Emperor's New Clothes. And we ended up getting it produced by Theater Books USA, which in the small world department was founded by your brother, your yeah. wonderful brother Jay, who was so such a gracious and wonderful um, guy and, and gave us our first show, which yeah. was pretty amazing. And Jay, Jay did a wonderful thing when actors, young actors would come in to audition for these shows. Um, he was just the soul of grace, really, to them. And, and they would sing about eight bars. And he'd go, thank you, that tells us everything we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd turn and go, and it was so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so anyway, those were you know those early lessons of the big mistakes you make. Don't work on something you don't love. Make sure you have the rights. You know, it's amazing adapt. how many people uh, plunge into a, uh, an adapt adaptation without having the rights. Yeah, yeah. We, that's a note you have to give over and over and over. Or or do it one time and yeah. never do it. Again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, I got into that situation accidentally. Some years ago, I was invited to try and make a musical out of It's a Wonderful Life, which I started to work out with Joe Raposo. And after about a year, we had enough to do a reading. Um, it was an invited audience. And there was a note in the Times to the effect that we were having this reading of our musical version of It's a, of a Wonderful Life. Suddenly, we get a note from a, a film company saying, now remember, you don't have the film rights. And I thought, okay, we didn't want them. But I asked my lawyer at that point, I said, I thought this was in the public domain. So would you find out about the film rights? Well, what he found out was that there was a typo in the contract that had been prepared by the Washington law firm. And that one word changed the whole meaning of the contract, and it turned out we did not have the rights. Oh. And from that day to this, we are still trying to find out how to get the rights. <laughs> yeah. So it, it can be very tricky. But at any rate, uh, I, so I had read your contract. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, the, the next step in my career, I had various reviews. And by the way, the first two successful review songs I had, and this is important to know, I, I started writing them not with the idea of putting them into a review. I started writing both of them because I felt very strongly about something that had happened and I wanted to express myself and chose to express myself in song. One of them, uh, I had been in Boston, my first wife was in a show there, and while I was there, I was reading in the papers how the church was trying, various churches were trying to suppress a new book about sex education. And when I learned the facts, it just made me furious. So I wrote a song called The Boston Begin. Which I just uh, happened which, to have a few lyrics here. <laughs> <laughs> which was about a girl who, who uh, can't 
she gets picked up at a bar and she's very attracted to the guy and he's attracted to her, but they are not able to consummate their romance because they never had the books to read. <laughs> and told them what to do. So I felt very strongly about that. And the other song uh, was from reading the paper every night and just, it's very much like today, just reading a page and going, oi, you know, it's going to be worse, oi. And finally I thought, oh, that, that could make a nice song with oi in it you know, throughout. So I wrote a song called The Merry Little Minuet, which was about rioting in Africa. And then I discovered that oi was better as a whistle. Uh, and those two songs, what the uh, Boston Begin was in New Faces of 1952. Um, uh, the Merry Little Minuet was in another review. And what I should have learned there was always to write from that sense of intense involvement, because that's the way the best songs so come out. And I, I just, I, I did, I had to type the lyrics out, or parts of the lyrics of those two songs, because I love them so much. Oddly, um, the Mary Minuet, I've been singing since I was in high school, but I thought it was written, I was told, by Tom Lehrer. <laughs> and of course, now I know it wasn't, but they're both such fabulous songs. You can Google them easily, and there are people on YouTube singing them. Uh, oh yes, yeah, they're singing. But the, the, these lyrics—I mean, this is this is um, the Boston Begin, which which is about this very prim and proper town, but it's set to this sexy music. It's hilarious, and it just—it's so contradictory and wonderful. It was a magical night with romance everywhere. There was something in the air. There always is. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we went to the Casbah. That's an Irish bar there. <laughs> the underground hideout of the DAR there. <laughs> Something inside of me said, watch your heart, mademoiselle, and it might be just as well to watch your purse in Boston. <laughs> they're just so deliriously wonderful and political. Here's, here's the other one that I, I thought for a long time was Tom Lehrer. They're rioting in Africa. <laughs> They're starving in Spain. There's hurricanes in Florida, and Texas needs rain. The whole world is festering with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans. The Germans hate the Poles. Italians hate Yugoslavs. Um, Itali uh, South Africans hate the Dutch. And I don't like anybody. Really. <laughs> Tom, I met Tom Lehrer, and he was performing in Australia. And he sent me a copy of the program just to show that he had given me credit. So, you know. <laughs> it's so great. And, and what I love about it, too, is that it's, you know, it's, they're, they're funny little review songs, but they're all about character. characters. You know, they're real. Like, they're me. They're you. <laughs> There's a curmudgeon in there, you know, the guy who doesn't like anything. is just pissed off at the world. And, and the, the, um, the, uh, begin, uh, the Boston Begin was sung by Alice Bosley, right? Um, Wonderful. Yeah. And, and uh, it's just this sad sack of a woman who apparently was wearing a baggy sweater and just telling this love story about ending That was her idea. It was very funny. Our producer had gowned her in this beautiful gown, and she said, no, that's not me. That's not that woman. And she borrowed Paul Lynn's sweater. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's just so great. But that is one of the things I so admire about you, Lisa, is that you there's not a song that you can find that isn't about character. It, it, they are so inherently about human beings um, in, in all kinds of circumstances. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just they are real flesh and blood human beings, and each song almost feels like a self-contained story. Well, that's because, and that leads me to the next step, that's because you don't really know the score to the body beautiful that well. No, I don't. That's <laughs> true. I want to ask you about that because it's about boxing, and we're well, working on a boxing musical. So I had these here. reviews, and um, Jerry Bach, had been writing with a man named, a, a very gifted lyricist named Larry Hollis Center. But they got the job to do Mr. Wonderful for Sammy Davis. And apparently, it was their first big Broadway show. And unfortunately, apparently, Larry Hollis Center froze and was not able to come up with the changes that were needed. So although the show was successful, they split up as a team. And Jerry, I was told, was looking for a new lyricist. And his publisher, a man named Tommy Volando, teamed us. And Tommy accomplished the impossible. He got the job for Jerry Bach and me, and we had never written a song together. And he got us the job to do the score for a Broadway show. <laughs> it was called The Body Beautiful, about <coughs> boxing. And although I knew very little and cared very little about boxing, and uh, I, I didn't hate it, so I thought, okay, uh, and this is my entree. Uh, and I, uh, when I began to work with Jerry, I realized that uh, we were very simpatico. We had, by the way, 
uh, we had only one huge argument early in our career. What we had to learn, and this may be important for those of you who have yet to collaborate, what we had to learn was that when we made criticisms, they were meant to be professional criticisms. But both of us were so thin-skinned that any criticism uh, just hurt. And we began to fight. Instead of listening to what he was saying and seeing is he, is he right or wrong, I thought, he's attacking me. And I, I was attacking him. And we had this big fight uh, and went home. And the next day it was over. And we learned from then on that in a professional relationship, criticism is for the, the good of the peace. <coughs> At any rate, uh, I learned a, a very important lesson. Uh, we had, a pre, uh, in our pre-rehearsal period, we were having staff meetings. And as kind of the new kid on the block who had never written a book music, I just listened, see what I could learn. And they were arguing about what director to hire. A, man, a, a name came up, George Schaefer, who had done a lot of successful television and had done some theater. And our company manager said, don't use him. And I thought, aha, he's, a, he's an alcoholic or something. And that wasn't what it was. The company manager said, he is so busy, he will not be able to get the book and, <coughs> and begin to study them until two weeks before we go into rehearsal, if that. And he should have months to acquaint himself with the book and, and to, to try and spot the weak spots and to give you guys assignments to, to improve it if you can. Um, but they went with George Schaefer, who was a lovely, talented man. And it turned out that when we went on the road, all the work we did on the road was the work that should have been done prior to going into rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So by the time we came back to New York, it was still with a very flawed show. And I learned that lesson, never go with a director who doesn't have months, yeah. months to figure out what he's doing. Yeah, there is something about Running out of time. Um, you know, on every show, eventually you run out of time. The curtain goes up. The show, somebody has, says the show is frozen. Uh, we're not making any more changes. That's the moment when I go into the ladies' room and have a nervous break. <laughs> every show, Deborah's <laughs> Lynch is in the ladies' room. <laughs> um, because you run out of time, and you know, there's this ticking clock on every show called rehearsal and equity, and you know the, the hours that you're given to make changes. So anything you are able to do in advance of that, you know, yeah. even not just months, years in advance of it, if you can, to get the show right, um, is a good thing. You know, it, it's part of, I think, what's right, but also what's wrong, maybe, about uh, new writers now, emerging writers, because they, producers have learned that they can give them umpteen workshops and readings and you know stages of development, and sometimes the show gets overcooked that way too. That's mm -hmm. the other danger of, of that kind of development. But it sure is good to have. Some lead time, and that's a scary. That's a scary story. But I just, I have to add. Okay, so you did your first Broadway show without having ever even met your collaborator, right? <laughs> right. Really yeah. amazing, and never having done a Broadway show, but yet you did a Broadway show. And um, I guess I wouldn't say that you failed, but it wasn't a hit show. It ran for something like sixty performances or something like that, right? We, I used to tell people, we ran five weeks. We would have run six weeks, but there was a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> The other lesson I learned, I should have yeah. listened to our publisher, because he kept telling me, based on what he knew of my review work, he said, Sheldon, go into yourself and write from yourself. And I, I didn't always. I was writing ballads, and I was not writing what I felt love was or love could be. I was writing what I thought a commercial love song should be. And consequently, when I go back and look at those lyrics, they're, they're not a totally cliché because uh, I, I had enough intelligence to try and make them fresh, but they weren't really, they, they were banal. True, yeah. And I learned that, uh, so that in Fiorello, I was very careful to try and, and say things that I really believed. Uh, and I that forgot. was the next show after uh, <coughs> yeah. Beautiful, and he won, you know, the Tony and the Pulitzer on his second Broadway show. Mm -hmm. It was really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I learned one thing on The Body Beautiful, too, we were talking about this before, that you cannot be too careful in writing a lyric. Um, we had a title song, The Body Beautiful, which was sung by uh, the, one of the, the main characters was a boxer, his manager. And it was his assistant. She was our romantic lead, our lady. 
And she had a song where she, uh, what she was saying was that she didn't really respond to brawn. What she responded to in men were other, other qualities. And I had written a new verse to go with it. Let me get this. I have and, it right here. No, I don't. And, uh, <laughs> Jerry and I sang it for the company. Uh, this new quatrain. Yeah, here it is. Which, when a man knocks another man down, all the customers shout with glee. But when a man picks another man up, <coughs> he's for me. <laughs> there was a big laugh. And I thought, what are they laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> a man picks another man up, oh, I see. <laughs> so I was able to, to change that by a man helps another man up. But, <laughs> but you cannot be too careful when you write lyrics. Uh, While well, I've got this page out, twice I had to rewrite lyrics. One, there was a lyric in Fiorello, which opened in 1959. And the leading lady had been, uh, she, uh, Marie Fisher had been uh, Fiorello Guardi's secretary. And she loved him, but she saw him marry someone else. And she got tired of waiting, so she was going to quit. She has a song, I'll marry the very next man. And I gave her a very sardonic uh, release. Uh, and in 1959, people bought it. And this, uh, I'll read it to you. As, as the years went on, and as people's consciences got raised, the lyric became no longer acceptable. And as a matter of fact, I went to, I think it was the 25th anniversary of the show at a production at Yale, and it got to this quatrain, and women in the audience booed. And I thought, it's time to change that lyric. She said, and if he likes me, and remember, this is supposed to be sardonic, and if he likes me, who cares how frequently he strikes me? I'll fetch his slippers with my arm in a sling just for the privilege of wearing his ring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were at Yale. But <laughs> <laughs> then the other one was, was odd because uh, in the apple tree, Jerry and I wrote a song for Eve to sing to Ad, uh, about Adam, uh, What Makes Me Love Him. And I based the song on a paragraph that Mark Twain had written in this brilliant story, The Diaries of Adam and Eve. And if you've never read it, please read it. It's just it's delicious. So I based what I wrote on what he wrote. As it was this. He is a good man, but I would love him if he abused me or used me ill. And as the years went by, I discovered that the word abused was no longer acceptable, and I had to find a, a, a new lyric. So interesting the way time um, affects shows. You know, I just had my first revival, which is really scary because you look in the mirror and go, no, it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But it was, and they, they revived Ragtime. And to see that show in the context of having an African-American president mm -hmm. um, was so interesting. It wasn't that kind of experience. It was just an amazing experience to realize, you know, how far at that point we had come. Um, and from the turn of the century when, you know, the, the ending of the show is, is um, kind of shocking, you know, in a way. I saw that revival, which was brilliant, and uh, for some reason it didn't work. I'm, I was introduced to the one of the producers the night I saw it, and she said, well, we took a chance. We didn't get stars. No stars, no advance, mm -hmm. no advertising. Um, yeah. There were, yeah, and a theater that was slightly too far north. Uh, yeah. And a poster, no offense to anybody, but when it was up in Times Square, it said ragtime at the bottom, and there was a water tank in front of it. Um, oh. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> so she said, smiling. Um, it was unfortunate, and yeah. it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful production. But it was so great to see it again and to do a little work and revision on it uh, and make it, um, you know, even a little richer for us. Uh, that was that was exciting. In that version, um, the character of younger brother uh, had never met the character of um, Tata in the earlier incarnation, and we added a little scene where their paths crossed uh. in um, Lawrence, Massachusetts. So that was an exciting discovery for this new version of the show. Yeah. You know. yeah. um, but it's like you just live and learn, don't you, in this yeah. business? And and you know you can almost chart your whole life if you write shows long enough, by 
you know, well, and then I learned, and I, you know, left that husband and married this one, and, you know, and, and, and oh, what, what year was that? Well, it was the year I did that show. You know, it, it all uh, relates to your... your, your the the you next know. big learning thing for me, we did a show called Tenderloin. Mm -hmm. We opened in New Haven, and it was a rocky opening, and afterwards we all had a meeting in uh, George, our director was George Abbott, we had a meeting in his suite hotel. And George, who was the soul of candor, said, gentlemen, I had a concept and it doesn't work. Anybody got any ideas? And I thought, don't look at me. And I realized that up until that time, I had done The Body Beautiful, I had done Fiorello, but I had never involved myself with the book. I had read the book looking for where the songs went, and that was the only thing I knew about the book. And now, suddenly, he's looking around the room saying, any of you got any ideas uh, about this show? And I thought, uh, I keep thinking, I'm Scarlett O'Hara. I will never do this again. Tomorrow, I will never be hungry. I thought, from now on, whatever show I do, I will get myself involved and read that book and study that book and look for the weak spots so that in advance I will know if something's wrong and maybe have ideas of how to fix it. Yeah. That it was an extraordinarily important lesson. I've never not been involved in the book, but probably because the first couple of shows we did, I wrote book four. I mm. learned how to do it, um, you know, to a certain extent on our early shows. We did a show, our first off broadway show was called Lucky Stiff which was a, a little musical farce based on a, a novel, although the show that we ended up with really has so little relationship to that novel um, that it's surprising for me anyway to go back and read the novel and think, wow, where did that show come from? Out of this, I would never think this was a good idea if I read it now. But the show was delightful and, and has a, had a, a lovely life, but it was the hardest show to write because not only was I a, a sort of a starting out writer, but it was a musical farce, and farce has to be fast, it has to be funny, it's like a little mechanical machine that keeps chasing you from behind going, what? fast and funny, <laughs> and you're you know, running to make it as fast and funny as you possibly can, and, and it kept spitting out ballads, which was, um, we would write a beautiful ballad, and, and it just wouldn't work in the context of the show, because it, it, you, you weren't prepared for it. Uh, it, was, it was a very interesting experience, we ended up with one song, which, um, actually is one of the, my favorite songs that we've ever written in that first show, uh, it's called Times Like This, and it's about a, a girl who is in a nightclub and she's all by herself, and she um, loves, she wants a dog to be with her for company instead of a man, and oh, it's, a it's, song. it's a lovely little song, and it, and it was the first time in a show that I ever felt um, that I was a little bit in command of um, my craft, because it was the predictable point in the show where when that song happened, everybody was ready for a rest. They wanted a ballad. They got a ballad, but it was a funny ballad, and it got a ha-ha-ha the first time she said it. It got a sort of a ha the second time she said it, and the last time it got <laughs> And it was so predictable and wonderful to, to get a consistent audience reaction, you know, uh, that I thought that was the first time and maybe that I was beginning to understand what I was doing. And it then then we wrote Once on this Island, which was our first Broadway show. It started also at Playwrights Horizons, but it moved to Broadway, and I wrote the book for that. And I have to say, looking back, that it is a really well-structured book. I'm really proud of that book, because it's like a very tightly told, economically told, ever-moving, gracefully told story uh, that has a lot of music in it. But Structurally, it's, it's very classic little... Um, Which prompts the question on my part, how much research do you do? And what tools do you use when you're ready? Well, that's an interesting question. I was going to ask you the same question, so we'll, we'll get to that. But I've gotten more research-oriented over the years because um, I'm basically a lazy person. And I, I just like to write and, you know, to take the time to read a lot and to... But, but I, but on one side of the I started to learn how to do research, actually, and I started looking at a lot of um, Caribbean folk tales. I, yeah. I started looking at art of the Caribbean. I started looking at, um, oh, uh, you know, the religion and the culture and the history of Haiti in particular and yeah. the uprising and, and all that, and, and a lot of that informed the show. And, and it enriches uh, your work, I think, and, and, and tells you some of the specifics of, of the characters' lives and how they live and stuff. So that was really the first show where I began to do 
research, and I did a lot of research on ragtime. I read a lot of yeah, biographies yeah. of the historical characters and a lot about the time, and even right down to the details of mother's clothing, what kind of corset she would have worn mm -hmm. and stuff, and why she would have made her stand more upright, and you know, all that sort of thing. Um, so I've come to like research, although I, I do find it a bit of a chore because mostly I just want to write the songs. I just want to get to those songs and get some music and let me set some lyrics, but I know that I, I have to do the research because it will just make it better. Yeah. How about you? I'm the opposite. I, I, uh, I hate the notion of having to start writing because I'm so afraid that it will come out terrible. <laughs> so I do endless research <laughs> and, and finally I reach a point where I think I can't stall any longer. I, I have to get to work. Yeah. Uh, so, I use a thesaurus and a rhyming dictionary, those are the tools, and depending on what the project is, maybe a history uh, that will take me up uh, of the time. For instance, with Fiorello, um, there's a wonderful, there was a wonderful writer named Bert Shevelo, who was one of the writers, uh, one of the book writers, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Mm -hmm. And Bert was very, very literate. And when he heard that I was doing Fiorello, he said, there's a, uh, there's a set of six books that are called Our Times, and they're written by a man who had been a newspaper reporter. And what they are is an informal history of the United States from 1900 to sometime in the 30s. So I bought the series, and it was an informal history. It didn't talk about the wars and the politics. What it talked about was fashions, and pop songs, and uh, what was in the news. So I looked uh, for the, the period that we were writing about uh, with Fiorello, and there was a photograph of a man who was on trial. And under the photograph was the caption, Little Tin Box. Mm -hmm. And when I read the, the paragraph about it, it turned out that during Jimmy Walker's administration, although he himself apparently was an honest man, he had surrounded himself with corrupt politicians. And when they were, uh, they were sued and they were on the stand, and at least one of them said, when he was asked where he got all this money, he said, well, my wife is very frugal, and uh, she saves a lot of money from, from making meals at home, and she puts every quarter she gets into this little tin box, and it happened to mount up to tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a very useful piece of research. <laughs> because when we were on the road with Fiorello, uh, Jerry and I had written a song called What to Do Till a Bootlegger Comes, <laughs> and it was a successful song. But George, we had a meeting once, and George Abbott said, that scene does not propel the show forward. We're going to cut that scene. We're going to need a new song. And he said, what I want to do is have the, uh, these hack politicians talking about the next mayoral election and, uh, and Jimmy Walker's problems. And I thought, oh my God, we can, we can use that for that song. Oh, uh, something else that's useful. Um, Jerry Bach and I were, uh, Hal Prince and his partner, Bobby Griffith, had seen The Body Beautiful. I only learned uh, uh, this past year that the reason they went to see it was that Steve Sondheim had seen it and said, you should see it because this is a good songwriting team. Mm -hmm. So they went and I met Hal that night and within a year, Jerry and I were doing Fiorello for him. And uh, one of the songs, uh, we had to write four songs on spec. He went to about three or four different young teams and gave us all the opportunity to compete. So uh, I read what, what they had in the book. I looked at, at the four scenes. And one of them was a going away scene. Fiorello LaGuardia had, in World War I had en enlisted in the brand new uh, uh, American Air Force. So there was a, a going away party for him and there was, they wanted a song that would be service rivalry. The, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, just all an active song uh, making fun of each other. So we wrote a song and I did research on birds since this was about flyers. <laughs> and after, I had every bird you could imagine in that song. And when we finished auditioning, and Hal's partner, Bobby Griffith, looked at and there was silence for a long time. <laughs> and then Bobby looked at me and said, Sheldon, Oscar Hammerstein had a term for what you just did. It's called research poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I had done. I had too much research. <laughs> You know, I find 
I'm working on a show right now, Stephen and I are doing a show with Susan Stroman, and it's set in the world of ballet, and the idea came to me from going to a museum, and, you know, reading the, the little legend of a particular sculpture, and, um, you know, you're, you're doing historical research, and you see a phrase, a little tin box, you know, you never know where these things will, will yeah. come from. It's, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. On Ragtime, um, well, on Ragtime, we had an audition as well. And, and um, so I think there were nine teams or something. I don't know who they were. Um, I never wanted to know, and I still don't know to this day, actually. But um, we, uh, you know, it was that same kind of thing, that, that sort of, what are we going to write, and where are we going to get it from? And we actually had a treatment that Terrence McNally had done, because that was sort of his uh, way of, of auditioning for the project. He wanted to make sure that uh, Yale Doctorow would approve and would like his take on it. And so we took this treatment and combed through it for song moments. And we had very, very little time to write the four songs that we were being asked to write. So I took, uh, I said, I'll take two lyrics and, and you take, and you write two pieces of music and then we'll swap. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we wrote four songs very quickly and did demos of them and, and, uh, and you know, ended up getting the job. But, you know, you do, you do, learn from these experiences, for better or for worse, um, you know, what, where ideas are, are pulled yeah. from and, and how to find them. I have a wonderful story I have to tell you, <coughs> um, because I love this story. When Jerry Bach and I played the four songs we've written, uh, we went to Hal's apartment. We played the first song, which was a strike song, the women are striking, and everybody loved the song. They said, that's great. And then, we did, uh, I think, the bird song, the aviation song, we didn't like. We did another song, I can't remember what it was, we didn't like that, and I thought, oh my God, uh, I'm striking out here. And then we did the fourth song, which was uh, a 1917 waltz for that going away party. It was supposed to sound like Irving Berlin, it was called Till Tomorrow. And Jerry Bach, who wanted to work with me because after The Body Beautiful, we didn't think anybody would hire us again. <laughs> Jerry wrote four waltzes, and he said, which one do you like? And I said, I like this one. He said, good, so do I. Anyway, we started to sing the song, and I made the mistake of looking at Hal when I got to one line, which was so uncharacteristic of me. Uh, it was like a lace valentine. Was, Parting is such sweet sorrow. I looked at him, and I grinned, which was a big mistake. <laughs> we finished the song. And Hal said, oh, come on, guys, this is a put-on. And I thought, I've struck out. I said, no, no, it's not. It's meant to be serious. And thank God, Bobby Griffin, his partner, who was older than Hal, said, Hal, you don't remember these songs. I was alive then. He said, this is like Irving Berlin. This is 1970. They're having this big fight where Hal is saying nobody's going to take it seriously. He laughed when he, when he sang it. Anyway, suddenly there's a knock on the door. And Hal said, don't say anything. This is our choreographer. This is Pete Gennaro. So Pete Gennaro came in, and Hal said, this is the number that the guys have written for the going away party. Uh, guys, uh, play it. So we did. I didn't look at anybody. I didn't smile. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the song, Pete said, ah, oh, it's 1917. It's Army Berlin. And Hal looked at me and said, OK, kid, you got the job. <laughs> 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 oh and isn't it amazing that Stephen Sondheim said, go see these guys, mm -hmm. you know, the show's not good, but the guys have promised. That's, mm -hmm. It's all of that um, wonderful, um, you know, mentoring and, and people sort of recommending other people and passing yeah. it along. That's quite By the way, he came, he came to uh, New Haven where we were trying to figure out, and he told me he loved the lyrics. He said, however, in Little Tin Box, you've got a false rhyme. Uh, I said, oh, I <laughs> have a false runner? He said, yes. It got uh, faith, hope, and charity, hard won prosperity. He said, they don't rhyme. I said, they don't? He said, you go to your dictionary. And I went to my dictionary and I looked, and sure enough, charity is eh, and prosperity is eh. And I called Steve and I said, Steve, in Chicago, they rhyme. <laughs> brings up a, a question of rhyme, and uh, I've come to the conclusion that whether you, you uh, indulge yourself with false rhyme or whether you are rigorous and try for true rhymes is a personal choice 
because the audience doesn't really care that much. I'm not sure I agree with you. That's, I have, I'm not sure I agree with that. Because what I, I mean, I tend to, you know, we're teaching here at the Drama School, Stephen and I. We run the Fellows program. I see a couple of my babies in the audience. Um, and, um, you know, we let them do whatever rhymes they want to. But oftentimes, when an audience is sitting there, they're listening to your work, if the rhyme is too false, you're, they, if they can't process what they're hearing. It's not like you can open a novel and reread it, you know, the next night or, or go back and see what you missed. You have one shot at it, and I always say <coughs> that it pulls the ear in a not good way. I mean, I think we're more used to it now with pop music, so yeah. I have to agree with you. Yeah. If a rhyme is that bad, then yeah, yeah that, that would be the story. You know, some and one, and you know, I, there's sort of crazy <coughs> things to get into that people do quite often, and I, I've stopped criticizing it for the most part. But I, yeah. in my heart of hearts, I think it, it, well, for me, it's also part of the puzzle of lyric writing. I just like to do it properly and. and perfect rhymes because it's a challenge, it's like a crossword puzzle. It's trying to, you know, figure out <coughs> those little tricky things that yep. keep you up nights, you know, with two words and you can't find, mm -hmm. you know, I've run out of rhymes in the English language and so, you know, and all it the forces time. you to be inventive. It does. To me, uh, writing lyrics, my own phrase part is, it's the art of substitution because you have That's an right. idea and you try and write it and you find you can't find the rhyme to rhyme with something that's set up earlier, so you have to say it a different <coughs> way. And constantly you're looking for different ways to say the same thing. I, I also, I, I try to be very strict with myself, and that's why recently I wrote something that doesn't rhyme, and I agonized over whether I would allow myself to use oh, it. I know what you're talking about. No, you don't. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is a new song. Uh, there's a project which uh, it's, it has to do with patriotic songs, and I was given a theme by the orchestrator Larry Hoffman. Oh, you do know this. You song. told me. Oh, and, uh, it was it, it was a wonderful theme, and I, and I wanted to write a, a song that reflected what's in the papers today, uh, what's going on. So I wrote a song, and uh, it's called. Uh, Oh, here it is. Reason to be thankful. Um, and in the first chorus, the lyrics are, there are lands where tyrants make the law, callous men who fiercely cling to power. In these lands, good people risk their lives as they try to make freedom flow. So I had a nice rhyme with power and flower. But in the second stanza, it's there are lands around this wounded world troubled lands oppressed by heartless tyrants. In these lands, few people dare to speak, for their safety lies in their silence. Now that's a false rhyme. But the more I thought about the song, I thought, it works. It's, I buy it. And there was something about the song and about the music that suggested a 19th century anthem. It didn't, uh, th th in a good sense, it was not necessarily totally uh, current. And as a matter of fact, I, I agonized a little more when I was getting uh, to the last line. I didn't have room to say, uh, uh, this is America that I call home. So I used tis, tis America that I call home. And I thought, dare I do that? <laughs> but in context, it sounded right. Yeah. So I decided to yeah. use it. So again, these are personal choices. You are allowed. <laughs> Thank you. When, Isher, when Charles Isherwood criticizes me, I'm going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed. Yeah, absolutely. You can tell a couple other things, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank you. unfortunate that we have two very cruel critics. You know, we won't, we won't, we won't go, there. go there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go there. <laughs> we will go back to other lessons we've learned. And she loves me. The lesson I learned from that show was that Jerry and I, in writing the score, had forgotten the first rule of musical theater, which is story, story, story. What is the story about? How do you get where you're going? We had indulged ourselves by writing so many songs. And when we got to Philadelphia on the pre-Broadway tour, we discovered that it was just drowning the audience in music when they wanted to be able to follow the story. And my memory, which is probably false, is that we cut 45 minutes of music. Well, mm -hmm. 
it was probably more like 15, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless yeah. but I learned, and in everything I've done since then, I've tried to think, what is the story? And is the song going really to get that story moved forward? Because when it doesn't, it can be in trouble. We, in Fiddler, we had a problem. Uh, there, in the second act of Fiddler, when the people are told they have to leave, we had, uh, written, Jerry and I had written a song for the rabbi to sing, uh, wouldn't it be nice if the Messiah came? And then we had a song, When Messiah Comes. And it was during our backers audition, everybody loved it. When we got to Detroit, and they, uh, by that time we had taken it away from the rabbi, we had given it to Zero Mostel to sing. <laughs> Zero sang it, and it died. And we, we didn't believe it. And so, of course, the first thing you, you tell the orchestra conductor, take it slower and make the orchestra softer. Because obviously they're not hearing the lyrics. <laughs> so he made the orchestra play slower and softer, and they were hearing the lyrics. And it died again, and it died uh, in all three previews. It was a comic song, wasn't it? It was a comic song? Yeah. And we asked people who were coming from New York, we said, what did you think of that song? They said, are you crazy? These people are being exiled, and you're give, giving us a comedy song? You expect us to laugh? Yeah. And we thought, oh, oh, that's pretty stupid. So <laughs> we, we cut the song. Zero yelled. He loved the song, but we cut the song. I still use it. Out of context, it works fine. And I, it's another discovery that context is so important. What will work and what will not work. And being ruthless about it. There are, there are two examples I can think of in my own work that are somewhat similar, both in the same show. In Once on this Island, um, we wrote two songs that were cut. Um, and one of them is this absolutely beautiful song called Come Down From the Tree, which gets done in cabarets now and by people around town. And everybody says, why did you cut that song? And, and we get letters from people wanting to reinstate it into the show, into the production that they're doing. And we always say, absolutely not. We love the yeah. song, but it doesn't belong in the show. And the reason is that it happened at a moment just when the main character, Team Moon, is setting off down the road to find her love. And she just happens to bump into this little girl who's also up in a tree as she was at the beginning of the show. And she sings this beautiful ballad called Come Down from the Tree. And the child comes down and she sends the child back to her <laughs> mother to take care of her. And everybody's going, get on with it. You know, and it was really a get on with it moment. And the other moment in the show was um, uh, an 11 o'clock number that we wrote for Team Moon again called When Daniel Marries Me. And uh, <laughs> it was so palpable because at that point in the show he said, Timun, I could never marry you. And then she sings this song called When Daniel Marries Me. And the whole audience is pretty much almost standing and shouting, He's not going to marry you! <laughs> so we had to have that beautiful song too. And that was a lesson. <laughs> was so upset because some of the music in When Daniel Marries Me in particular is so gorgeous and he was really mourning the loss of that particular song but you know this is what you have to do to make the to shape a show and to you know sort of kill your babies as they say uh, and you know I always say they'll prop up in, you know side by side by Alan's authority <laughs> 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 which leads to a question that I'm always asked I'll ask you it uh, how does your collaboration work? Music first, lyrics first, what happens? Do you know what's so funny? I have that written down on one of my little index cards because both, both um, Sheldon and I were nervous, you know, that we wouldn't, you know, we would <coughs> run out of things to say, which is obviously ridiculous. But, you know, <laughs> but um, one of the questions was, um, I don't want to ask Sheldon which comes first, music or lyrics, but I have to. <laughs> so I just have to know. Um, with Stephen and me, it's a little of everything, because often if we're working in the same room, we improvise. So, you know, whoever comes up with an idea, he'll put his fingers on the keys, and I'll say, that's great, that's great, and I'll write a little lyric, and we sort of improvise. Once in a while, I will write a lyric first. Many times I encourage him to give me some kind of music first, even if it's a vamp, or even if it's a little motif, or anything, because... And does um, he? Yeah, yeah, I force him to. <laughs> he doesn't like to, but he does, and it's great. It's very helpful for me because, um, well, I think it was um, Marilyn Bergman uh, said, mm. the words are on the tips of the notes. 
And mm -hmm. I always find that whenever I hear a beautiful piece of music, or even a partial piece, or even just a little emotional feel, you know, because the emotion lives in the music, I can, it makes it much, much easier for me to write a lyric. But I can do it the other way, too, in, in ragtime back to before was all in the first. And, you know, there are many examples of that, but mm. it, it, it goes back and forth and, and, and forth. I can't improvise. Uh, I've tried. I have to be alone and thinking. Um, so when Jerry Bach and I started to work, we worked in a way that I've never worked with another composer that way. Jerry, once we both knew what the source material was, Jerry would go into his studio and begin to dream up musical numbers. And when he had anywhere from 8 to 12 or 14 or more, he would send me a tape. I w and this was the way we got the momentum going. I'd listen to the tape, and he would say, I think this one is for the butcher, I think this one is for tackle, I think this one, I don't know what the hell this is, but I like it. <laughs> and those were usually the most interesting ones. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we started. Uh, and he was very generous, because on any tape, there might only be two <laughs> melodies, which uh, coincided with mm -hmm. ideas that I had that I wanted to write. So that's the way it always started. And eventually, it would get to a point where I had an idea, and I thought, I don't want to be constrained by music, because there may have to be several choruses. And I may have to, once I get the first chorus, then in writing the second chorus, I may have to go back and carpenter the first chorus so that it's metrically similar to the second. And if there's a third chorus, God forbid, then the same thing will happen. <laughs> and I was very curious when I gave one of these lyrics to Jerry to see whether he was as adept at setting a lyric as he wasn't writing first. And I discovered not only was he that adept, but he was also, because Jerry was uh, a, a good lyricist himself, he was very, uh, very adept. Yes, Terry. Oh. <laughs> five minutes. Five more minutes. No more questions. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> See? So what? Take my notes. That's <laughs> 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 pretty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good. I mean, it's so good. But, no, I mean, really, he's been fantastic. And, and you know, we, we were so lucky to have taken part in that program. And now we are trying to, you know, do the same thing with the Dramasco Fellows in a way. And, and you know, give something back. But anyway, that's that's really the last thing that I wanted to say. We could talk all day. I think. The only other thing I will say is I've just written a new musical, and it's the only musical current, I think, that does not contain the F word. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm a prude, but the way I was brought up was you didn't use that word. I was in the army for three years, and we were very free with obscenities, profanity. But when it comes to writing, I still cannot get myself to use obscenities. I made a terrible mistake. I did an adaptation of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, I think I mentioned. And I thought, I will make it more contemporary by using a lot of profanity in it. <laughs> and the audience, everybody I spoke to, begged me not to. They said, this movie is practically sacred writ to yeah, us. You yeah. daren't do that. Yeah. <laughs> actually, that leads into what my question was. And I didn't know if I, I was actually watching you on TV on my phone. <laughs> 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 But which is awesome. But I wonder, does it? Do you feel constrained when you're writing from source material, trying to set lyrics that come from a pre-existing, as opposed to trying to think? Do you know what I mean? Do you feel compelled to use lines that people have? No, I, I, or, quite you know, the contrary. Yeah, yeah. Quite the contrary. The reason that that I that I will have chosen to to try and adapt that work is because I love it. Yeah. And uh, in being true to the author, if I can use some of his actual language. Not only does it make my job easier. In fact, I hope nobody ever reads Tevye's orders carefully because they will see where most of the lyric for If I Were a Rich Man came from. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, the source material is always, if you fall in love with it, it is your, it's your Bible. And the ragtime is our Bible. Mm -hmm. We're working um, crazily on a, um, an adaptation of the movie Rocky. And when you read the screenplay, it is magnificent. That's all I can say. It is poetry in on the street nature. It's, mm -hmm. it's colloquial, it's touching, it's funny, um, and it's very inspiring. Of, it inspires songs. So, you know, that it's always, it's always um, great. Oh, good, good. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Please. Um, I just, just want to say to Lynn is that uh, I was on the Drama Desk nominating committee the year that there was the uh, revival of 
uh, right time, and we all loved it. <laughs> so we, we, we were all, we, we were all really, really. And uh, so the, uh, if you want to be comfortable using the F word, all you, I teach at colleges, I'm an adjunct, all you have to do is hang around the college for about 10 minutes and that's all you're going to hear. Yeah. <laughs> but what, I wanted to ask a question. Um, I was at the Drama Desk, uh, big meeting, uh, um, the conference uh, last uh, summer, in June. Uh, Carol Hall seemed surprised to find out that a lot of the um, lyricists and book writers did not necessarily have a composer when they were writing. Everybody always works together. And the reality is a lot of us don't necessarily, we're writing anyway, or in my case, we've worked with a composer that we don't necessarily want to work with again for various reasons. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my question is, because um, you've talked a little bit about BMI, how, does, how do people like uh, who are writing and need to find a composer, how do we go about uh, finding a composer? Because considering the fact that also that a lot of composers also have something in their closet, which they, because they are like closet lyricists also, so they have their own favorite yeah. work to do. So what, what do you suggest for finding a composer they can work with? Well, my answer to that would, would be um, to network, to uh, come to Dramatist Guild events, um, and uh, you know, try and contact people whose work you admire, uh, if you see something in, in an off-Broadway theater that you like, uh, and you like the particular composer, write them a nice note. Um, it really is about meeting people and getting to know who's working and who's working you feel simpatico with. There's the BMI Musical Theater Workshop, there's the ASCAP Workshop, there are, you know, there's the, um, there are all kinds of places where you can see new writers and young writers at, you know, presenting their work and, and get a feeling for what's happening. It's hard, you know, it's, it's I mean, I've had a, a collaboration for, where's my, <laughs> there you are. Um, like this is, I think, our 29th year. It's amazing, and we're so lucky because you know it's like a long marriage, which I also have. You don't have to, you don't go looking anymore, you know, <laughs> which is scary. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky, a lucky girl in that respect. So, um, but I would say to meet as many people, go to as many uh, off Broadway and yeah. off off Broadway shows as you can, and see who's writing, and see who you respond to, and try and get in touch with them. Don't we still have at the Guild meetings where yeah. composers mm -hmm. sit down? Yeah. I think we have one in April, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, check, check your e newsletter on that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I have uh, three questions for Sheldon, and you can answer one or all three here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about your, you said you rewrote the lyric for Abused, Used Me Ill. Could you, would you like to share? You the abused mm -hmm. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. in, in an apple tree? Um, what was your, and also about Tenderloin, I've always been curious about that show. Uh, what was your inspiration or uh, motivation to write that? I mean, you know, we were just at the beginning of the 60s, things were starting to change. It, it feels like an old-fashioned subject, and, and I'd love if you'd speak a little bit about that. And then all, the third thing, and this is maybe for Lynn as well, where are the Tommy Volandos of today that bring people together? We were talking about you know, collaborations. I wish I, that I wish I could answer. I've heard so much about this legendary guy that you know was more than a publisher. I, that I can't answer. Um, the abused lyric, what did I do? Oh, uh, I wrote a, a different lyric based on the fact that Fiorello was known as the little flower. <coughs> so the lyric I gave her was, when he proposes, I'll have him send me tons of roses, sweet-scented blossoms I'll enjoy by the hour. Why should I wait around for one little flower? <laughs> yeah, so that took the sting out of that. Tenderloin, we made a big mistake. Tenderloin was based on a, a wonderful novel, but in the, and it's the novel of a young man on the make. And in the adventure, he meets a minister and a minister who's trying to clean up the tenderloin, the, uh, the red light district. And they use each other. But in the book, the minister is a relatively small character. When we did the show, uh, he was made into a major character and we got a star to play him, Maurice Evans. So that it was what we discovered on the road was every time we went to the, the church, people lost interest. They wanted to go back to the red light district. That's where, that's where all the fun was. And we found that we could not cut Maurice Evans' role down because then it was unbalanced. And it was just a mistake. Recently, 
I was contacted by two very, very good uh, writers. I, I've seen work they did on television, and I knew about a musical they did in London called Betty Blue Eyes, which was supposed to be very good. And they said they wanted to rewrite the book and make it more contemporary. And so John Weidman, uh, speaking for his father, who had collaborated on the original book, we said, go, try it. And what they came up with was something that made every character so unlikable. <laughs> the boy, the minister, the girl, everybody. It was very contemporary, but everybody was corrupt. <laughs> and I thought, that, that's not what I want to write. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it reminds me, I was once invited uh, to be the lyricist for uh, uh, a musical based on The Thin Man. <coughs> Arthur Lawrence was to direct and uh, uh, Gurney was to do the book, and Charles Strauss was to do the music. And at one of the early meetings, the producers asked Arthur Lawrence, they said, can you describe this book in, in a sentence or two? And he thought for a minute, and he said, yes. It's about Nick and Nora Charles. They're an innocent couple dancing their way through a corrupt world. And everybody said, that's great. And I thought about that and thought, then I can't do this show. I can write one corrupt for one corrupt couple. I cannot write for a corrupt world. I, 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 I can write for a lot of innocent uh, Nora Charles. So I called Arthur and said, I can't do this. And uh, the show was a disaster, by the way. <laughs> um, I have I'm very close to a table reading on a musical comedy about illegal immigration. And I, my plan is to tape record the, the table reading, make rewrites based on that, and then shop that draft to theaters that might take a chance and develop these. Can you comment on the wisdom or folly of my plan? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, it sounds very sensible to me. Uh, if you have a table reading, it's wonderful to have that to refer to it. Uh, the the tricky thing is, will there be an audience? No, it's just, just a table. Be friends so that, and family that reading. then you don't get an accurate sense, especially if there's comedy in it. Yeah, you have no idea uh -huh. what's happening there. But for your own purposes, I think it makes great sense to do that, so you'll have a reference. Yeah. We do. Steve and I do that often when we're working on a show. We will. We we on one show. Uh, we actually did our own little reading, we just read everything together and taped it, and then you let a few days go by and you listen to it, and it, when you get a little distance from it, it will tell you very clearly what is working, what mm -hmm. isn't, where you're, you're just getting bored with your own work. You, know, mm -hmm. you can feel those little uh, you know, cues, and, and it will help you to rewrite. I think it sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Or maybe do you rewrite into a second reading. If you have professional actors doing it, you better get their permission to do that because equity could be. Yeah, we're not supposed to take. Uh, well, we can, so that's that's right. Yeah. 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 Unless you get them to sign, you just say it's just for us. Just for right. yeah. 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 Um, in regard to false rhymes, perfect rhyme, mm -hmm. Sheldon, doesn't it bother you that? The lyrics kind of wash over you. Well, you make much more. I mean, the sentence of Sheldon make much more sense because the, I feel the rhymes kind of guide the, the listener into what to think next. In, in musicals today, in *The Awakening* and so forth, I feel the lyrics kind of wash over you, and you don't get a sense of what the author is trying to say. The lyrics are trying to say. It has. What do you feel about that? I mean, if you don't get a sense of what the author is saying, then it's a bad lyric. Yeah. Then, then he's not capable of the lyric. But, Go listen to Book of Mormon, which is the biggest hit ever, and you will hear a lot of false rhymes in it. Okay. Um, and another question for Sheldon. There's a lyric in She Loves Me, uh, Where's My Shoe? I, she goes, ha, 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 see. In Barbara Cook did, did it originally, obviously, and she had all the ha, 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 ha's in Candy. Were you thinking, I, don't, I should have asked you, I, I'm John Berger, I write these sometimes. I should have um, asked you this years ago. Um, Sometimes, you know, do you think of the ha-has in regard to Candy? Was that a reference you were making? No, uh, Jerry, that was uh, one of the pieces of music. Actually, he had written that as an instrumental piece. Oh, okay. He did not intend that to, uh, to have lyrics to it, but I listened to it, and I thought, Amanda is hysterical mm. in this scene, and that music would lend itself very well to a song about hysteric. Mm -hmm. And if you're hysterical, there's got to be a place you go, ha, 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 ha. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. I was writing in character. Well, yeah. In diseased right. character. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it all 
always clear to you, and I guess it's a question for both of you, if something should be in music, should be a song, or something should be dialogue? Or is that is that always clear to you, or is there ever an issue where you're not quite sure which way to express that? It's usually pretty clear, although sometimes it's usually pretty clear. Um, sometimes I've had the experience of setting things in music that uh, particularly fights for some reason when the people are singing things in anger that somehow always end up in scenes. You know, once I've set them, I get embarrassed by them. You know, I, I sort of think, oh, that's so over the top. You know, it should be a scene. But usually I think it's pretty clear. I, usually it's pretty clear, but again, like Lynn, I've written songs where once we get into rehearsal, we see it should have remained a, a, a sentence. A sentence, you know? yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's just, it should just be a sentence, yeah. not a whole song. That, that but you find that out, if you don't find that out in rehearsal, you find it out in front of an audience. Right. Uh, we had, in Fiddler, we had a wonderful song <coughs> for Huddle and Perchik. Uh, it was called If I Were a Woman. It was a, a fight song, an argument song. And it was a, a very successful song. It ran about four and a half minutes, and the audience loved it. And one day, out of town, after, after the show, Jerry Robbins said, I want to cut that song. We said, why? It works. He said, I know it works. But we're very, the show is very, very long, and I can do the same thing in 35 seconds of dance. And he said, just let me try it. If the dance doesn't work, we'll go back to the song. It's a lovely song. As soon as he did the dance, we thought he had compacted it and, and said everything that had to be said in 35 seconds, and that's the whole thing. Whoops. What's the, the longest MFW um, from start to finish that the show has taken from like, the idea to getting it you know, out there? Um, for me, I can answer that fairly easily. I think it, I would have to say it was, well, let's see. Dessa Rose took about 10 years from the time I found the book until the time it finally got to the stage. But a good number of those years was trying to convince <coughs> Stephen Clary that it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, the really long one, was The Glorious Ones, which I uh, read the, the novel in, thank you, thank you, I love it too, actually. Uh, I think I read the novel probably in 1983, worked on it with another collaborator that I uh, was doing some work with at the time. We went through very many incarnations, could never get it to happen, dropped it, but it was always on my radar and we you know, were looking for a new project in the early 90s, in 91, 92, and I remembered that book. And we went back to it and kept writing it and writing it and writing it. It was the hardest show to write because it was about theater people, um, <clears throat> but it was also about uh, changing theater and you know set in the 16th century. It was it was just a complex little nut to crack, and it took a long time to really feel comfortable with it and to to make it happen. And then we did it in Pittsburgh, and then we brought it to New York, and it was it was a long journey. So 20 years, I would say, for that. One. I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of the Broadway shows that I did, of course. There were producers involved, so it was like two or three years at the most. But there is a show, it's my novel in the closet. I have a song, a, a show, based on a Russian play. The play was called Dragons. And I've had it done at six colleges, and I'm still working on it. It's about 30 years now, and I will continue to work on it until I get it right. <laughs> Well, uh, if it's something, if it's an adaptation, of course it's there, and you love it, and you're and you're ready to it. Um, if it's an original, there has to be at least an act. The characters have to be developed enough so that you know how they talk, and what they're thinking, and what they're feeling, and what they want. Otherwise, you can't start because you don't, you have no idea what they're going to say. So at least an act, and preferably more than that. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree with that, although. You know, if you write in your own book, if you happen to be doing your own book right. and it happens to be an original idea, what we've done from time to time is we'll outline and we'll, we'll, we'll know how the show starts, how the first act ends, how the second act probably starts, and how the show will end at the end. And a few key points in there, and then sometimes we'll write two or three or four songs to explore the vocabulary, the tone, the musical tone, stuff like that. And those those songs may or may not end up in there, but it, 
is kind of a jumping off point. So that's another way. So the answer to your way. question is it's that in the musical whatever. theater there are no rules. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you never know it. something that shouldn't work will work, something that should work doesn't work. There are no rules. <laughs> Well, I just want to make a comment. I want to thank you both for all the joy you've given us for what you've done. And I have to tell you, two of my favorite shows of all time, the glorious ones and the Man of No Importance. And I think the Man of No Importance is a perfect show. And I don't understand why it didn't run. It was in New York. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? It's a beautiful show. We just saw it um, again uh, in Brooklyn um, not too long ago. The gallery was out there did a wonderful, wonderful small production of it. Not so small, actually. And um, it was wonderful to see it again and to realize um, how much I love it. And uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about that show, if you don't know the show, not a whole lot of people got to see it because um, it was at a limited run at Lincoln Center. But um, it, it, it feels like a perfect, for some reason, we did it with Terrence McNally, our very dear collaborator. And it, it, the way the book scenes become songs, the way the songs weave into book scenes is so seamless and um, really good. You know, it's like I'm, I'm just not, I'm not being immodest. I'm just like sort of surprised, you know. I just want to add to my comment. What can one say about you? I mean, you've done well, so much. Well, <laughs> 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 you know, I just have to thank you both. I mean, I think it's amazing what you've accomplished in your career. And I think you all should be inspired by it. Thank you. Yeah. Both of you. Um, I'm wondering, do you um, read reviews, and if so, why or why not? I I did a, a version of the Christmas Carol once, and uh, <laughs> and our Scrooge was Richard Kiley. And once we were going to a radio interview, and we shared a long uh, car ride, and he told me how when he did uh, Men of La Mancha, uh, he had uh, the first review was just said, why is this? this man who can't sing and who can't act, why is he doing a musical? He should stick to something else. And he, he said he resolved at that point never again to read another review, and he never has. And I thought, good, I make the same resolve, and I have read every review. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't not, and it's, it can be painful. I make the same result, and I never have. <laughs> I don't read them once in a blue moon. My husband, who does read my reviews, um, will say, you really could read this one. <laughs> oh. Or, you know, this one would, you know. But usually, you know, they're just too painful. And the bad reviews, even if you get 29 excellent reviews mm -hmm. and one bad review, that's the one that goes right into the, some part of, or, I don't know, some part of your brain in the cortex mm -hmm. and stays there forever. I read the reviews on Lucky Stiff which wasn't a disaster at all. They were, you know, mixed, but a lot of good stuff. But I remember every bad word they said, so I just, it's unhealthy and paralyzing. And because the truth of the matter is, what can you do? You know, what can you do but go forth and write your shows and have a writer's life? And, you know, count yourself lucky that you do have a writer's life. And um, if you can accomplish that and keep working uh, and not let them drag you down, then you're the lucky one. And, so, I can be outraged on somebody else's behalf when I read a bad review, but when they write about me, I think maybe they're right. Yes. <laughs> 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 that's, that's the bad one. Yeah. Two more. So, um, ladies, about this. Um, I have a question for Jane. Um, Hi, thank you for being here tonight. I wanted to ask you about uh, your working relationships. I understand you've been with uh, your, in your marriage for a long time. Yeah. So, I'm, both of but, my marriages. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, <laughs> what do you do then when? It, it, when you come across a partner that mid, at some point in your working relationship you go, this guy is an alcoholic or this person is, this is not healthy. What, do you have any advice to that? I started a project uh, a number of years ago and I thought I need a composer uh, <clears throat> and I was familiar with a show uh, called The Spitfire Grill mm -hmm. uh, oh. which has a lovely score and I contacted that particular composer. Mm -hmm. um, the project was based on the Moliere play the doctor in spite of himself. We started working on it, and the first time he played for me, I thought, oh my goodness, he doesn't understand what this show is about. <clears throat> a lot of what he did was just wrong, and we had long talks, and he made a lot of notes, and during the course, uh, over the course of a year, it didn't get any better, and I thought, I'm gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to sit down, and I'm, it's gonna be very awkward, but I have to tell him this isn't working. 
And then I discovered that when the Spitfire Grill opened, his book writer and lyricist, who was his best friend, died. And he told me that he was still in mourning and unable to write, and he withdrew. And that's the only time I've had an experience like that. I wound up doing the music myself, which I love. <laughs> I, I think, I think, you know, I, I don't know if you're in that situation, and maybe that's why you're asking. But, I just got divorced. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you know, at some point, it will hit the fan. You know, whatever's bothering you in your relationship, whether it's a real marriage or collaborate, a collaboration, you know, it will, you know, if there's a problem, it will out, and you have to discuss it. And by the way, that brings up the Drummers Guild has a collaboration form. It's very flexible, so you can kind of make your own, but it's wonderfully useful. And I found out how useful it was. Uh, Stephen Schwartz called me this a number of years ago. He was involved in arbitration. Uh, a set designer had come to him with an idea, which he loved, and so they started to work on it. And something told Stephen he should sign a collaboration agreement, and they did. And sure enough, at a certain point, the, they had a big falling out, and they were going their separate ways, and it was a matter of uh, how, they, uh, how they would uh, share the royalties if this ever got on. So it came to an arbitration, and thank God for that collaboration agreement. Because of it, we were able to solve the whole problem. It, it, it didn't need to be uh, ever adversarial any more than it was. Last I just had my first musical workshop last summer, and it was like the best week of my life. You get so close to the cast, it's so exciting, you can't sleep, and then you have your reading, and it's kind of like the next day you fall off of the cliff, you know, and how do you deal with that? How do you stay emotionally grounded in a career that sometimes feels like it's so much about these like ups and downs? Well, because you have a life, too, and you have to live your life, and writing is, um, is one of the many wonderful things you can do. You can eat, you can, you know, have love, do whatever. Um, you have to kind of put it in perspective, I think. And also, you know, when if there is such a thing as postpartum depression, you will have that when the show closes abruptly or when it closes inevitably. Um, you know, the next day you wake up and you're blue and you're sad and you're, you know, empty and, and what do you do? And how Prince generally starts a new show the next day. <laughs> so, you know, there, there are ways to get over that feeling. It is an inevitable feeling. But, you know, you just keep writing. Keep writing. Think what you're going to write next. Or, you know, go back to work on that project and maybe go to the library or go to a movie and find a new project that you might want to start doing. What, what you said is brilliant. You must have a life. Yeah. I remember my first wife was in a show with the actor Shirley Booth. And a number of the chorus kids were asking, Miss Booth, what is it like to be you? And she said, you have to have a life because you're in the theater for two hours a night. The rest of the day, you've got to live your life. Uh, I, I did a show that was very unsuccessful, Rex, with Richard Rogers. And we, there were such fights, not with Rogers, who was a darling, but with uh, the other people. And when the show closed, uh, my response was for the next three months, was to go for long walks and have mental arguments with everybody in the company. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a terribly dark time. And eventually, because I also have a life, eventually it, it calmed down and I was able to yeah. do other things. Yeah. But you have to have it, was, it was agony for three months. You know, the truth of the matter is writing for theater, being in a show, you know, doing anything that anybody does connected to the show, it is kind of a false world. I mean, we're all pretending. We're telling stories, we're pretending to be other people, we're channeling characters and, and all that stuff, and it's very intense. And you make what seem like the longest, greatest friendships with the people involved. <laughs> and finally, you know, the show closes and you still know them, but you, they're not your friends so much anymore. You have your real friends, you know, who <laughs> you go out to dinner with for 29 years, you know, and, you know, certainly you do make friends on shows, and, you know, I have some wonderful friends that I've made in the course of shows, but. It is a slightly artificial world, and you have to understand that. Yeah. So. Great. I'd like to thank Lynn and Sheldon.